Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a conversation with political satirist Jimmy Tingle with excerpts from the audiobook of Nathan Ballingrud's collection, Wounds, Six Stories from the Border of Hell. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. Jimmy Tingle is one of the first people I interviewed in the Boston comedy scene years ago. He was hosting and producing a stand-up show on race relations that featured, among others, Patrice O'Neill and Sue Costello. During my 20 years covering this scene, Tingle has always been a community-minded guy, whether it's been as a theater owner for five years or his Humor for Humanity comedy benefit shows. So it wasn't a surprise when he declared his candidacy for lieutenant governor of Massachusetts in the Democratic primary last year. He eventually lost, but garnered 41.3% of the vote as a first-time candidate. His new show, 2020 Vision, recounts his campaign, surreal moments like having Matt Damon and Paula Poundstone record robocalls on his behalf, and it presents some of his out-of-the-box ideas, like using exercise bikes as a power source or windmills near the highway to power traffic lights. Tingle is a political comedian, but he's never been a fire-breathing, tear-it-all-down satirist. He's always been optimistic and upbeat. It is no easy feat to look at the divisions in this country and offer optimistic solutions. I sat down with Tingle in the podcast kitchen and asked him about how he remained so hopeful the one time I ever saw him angry in a political discussion, about his early days in the Boston scene and the New York comedy scene, about the campaign, how recovery inspired his political bid, how he believes in government, his cameo on Veep, and a lot more. And stick around after the conversation for an excerpt from the audiobook of horror writer Nathan Ballingren's exquisitely disturbing new short story collection, Wounds. And now, here's Jimmy Tinkle. So, so would you ever write a book? You've had quite a yeah. history. Yeah, I would. Mm. And I've been thinking about, as I started to do this show, you know, you do the show and you're trying to tell a history, but you don't have all the time to tell a history. And I don't really want to pe- repeat old material i think a lot of the material is still evergreen even though some of it is just i was listening to the tonight show set recently and so much of it is relevant Mm -hmm. and conan o'brien set with immigration and parking it's relevant i've been posting them on facebook i've been posting um i was doing some throwback thursdays on facebook uh on my business page anyway got a lot of reaction but it's relevant, mm-hmm. you know, so I think writing a book will allow you really to do it more of a deep dive, obviously, a deep dive. It doesn't have to be a show. It doesn't have to be performed. I don't have to get a theater. I have to have a producer, you know, just to, to focus and, and set aside time and focus and um, prioritize it and, and get it done. Mm-hmm. Well, it will it'll allow you to not have to get a laugh. Which is exactly. which I wondered about that dynamic. You ran for lieutenant governor in yeah. 2018 in, yeah. in Massachusetts. Out on the, the campaign trail, your instinct as a comedian, did that help you or hurt you? It helped me greatly. Mm-hmm. It helped me greatly. And it was liberating not to have to get a laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, but the people often expected it. You know, I think I think initially they did... You know, when I'd go into these town committee meetings, it would be like, you know, they had seen my shows or they had, you know, they were smiling usually. And they're not always smiling for candidates, but with me, Mm -hmm. they were just, you know, kind of like, oh, we got the comedian here, you know, because that's how they know me. But then when I start to talk about why I'm running and the seriousness of it, they, that was, I think compelling for them Mm -hmm. and they uh and it connected with the audience Mm -hmm. so they weren't expecting me to be be funny after that but the but a couple of jokes or a couple of observations if it advances the story is fine you're not going up to doing a tight five you know to open up right your thing um but you would have the instinct if if something (laughs) comes up to make a joke i'd imagine every once in a while maybe you'd have to say yeah this is inappropriate here i i have to choke that back for a second um 
I think there was probably some instances like that, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but for the most part, I was really trying to overcome the perception that it was serious mm -hmm. or that it wasn't serious, mm -hmm. that it was not a publicity stunt, that mm -hmm. it wasn't, um, you know, uh, Pat Paulson runs for president, um, mm -hmm. that it wasn't Jimmy Tingle for president, the funniest campaign in history, that it wasn't that. Right, because that you'd was, done that frequently. Yeah. You had other shows, yeah. Jimmy Tingle for president. Eight, in 2008, 2012, actually 2000, I did it. It wasn't called that. It was called Jimmy Tingle for president. Um, in 2000, 2008, 2012, 2016, I would update it and do it again. It was fun. It was a fun way to kind of be in the moment, rele relevant, entertaining around what's going on with your own platform, etc. Mm. Um, but it was really important to, especially right out of the box, to establish yourself as, as serious and try to... Uh, not overcome the aspect of being a comedian, but just go beyond it. For example, Al Franken. Mm. So many people said to me, you need to read Al Franken's book. Mm -hmm. Have you read that by any chance? No, I do have it. In the, uh, yeah. It's in this it's, room it's with in us your collection. right now, but I, don't, I haven't read it okay. just yet. I'm on page 18. No. <laughs> no, I read most of that. I read it until he resigned, actually. Mm -hmm. and But his whole thing was, he had to overcome Saturday Night Live and mm -hmm. being a comedian. And his instincts initially were to be funny. Mm -hmm. and But he also went to Harvard. And and he, I, I don't know if he went to Harvard Law, but um, yeah, I know he went to Harvard undergrad. And his campaign said, listen, you need to... But he was an activist. I mean, he had helped on campaigns. He had mm -hmm. been active. And they said, you need to put Saturday Night Live in the rear view mirror and you need to focus on your academic credentials at Harvard and you need to focus on your activism and you need to focus on the things that you've been doing and the serious. And he went for many, many years without trying to be funny or without being funny. Mm -hmm. And the only time I saw him funny the whole time uh, that I can recall of Al Franken's Senate, Senate career was at the convention when he was up there with Sarah Silverman. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that. It was a pretty cool scene. Uh -huh. with Sarah Silverman and Al Franken, they were trying to quiet the Bernie people down uh -huh. <laughs> at the convention when Hillary was getting the nomination. And he was out there and he was funny. And, uh, you know, he wasn't just funny, but he started to lighten up after he had the credibility of being a senator. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to do that from the beginning to really, you know, just... People want seriousness. And the other thing that was challenging is because of Trump, people did not want, I mean, I think a lot of people did not want an entertainer. Mm -hmm. They're like, we got enough comedian. We got a comedian in the White House. We don't need anybody else. Mm -hmm. We don't want an entertainer. We want, in, in some people's minds, we want, you know, serious. So there was even more reason to be serious mm. I and mean, the book is why not me right the name of the book was al frank and giant of the senate giant of the senate yeah and i think he was thinking about running for president mm. well, one of the, the things i thought about when you when you announced that you were running was all of the wild stories that i heard and i keep hearing about the ding ho days mm -hmm. and is somebody gonna bring something up you know you you've been in that situation mm -hmm. you would have is somebody going to bring up guilt by association of all the stories of people doing coke off a piano or whatever? <laughs> you, were you worried about somebody bringing no, that up? I wasn't worried about bringing that up. I mean, part of my, one of the reasons I was running is, I don't know if you, you've heard it in the stump speech, but, you know, during the 80s, I lost three friends to alcohol and drugs. Right. I personally was going downhill in a big way about, with, because of that and um, primarily alcohol, but drugs were involved as well. But anyway, so I'm going down, and I just felt like, you know, I need to I need a change. So I started calling places for help, detoxes, rehabs, treatment centers. I would get the runaround. Mm -hmm. There's no beds. There's long lines. Call back next week. You don't have insurance. I called the uh, Cambridge City Hospital. They had a 
partially federally funded program called Cahill 3 at the time. This is 87, mm -hmm. the winter of 87, around Chris December. Uh, and I said, I said to the guy who answered the phone, I really need help. And without missing a beat, this man said, you called the right place. Mm -hmm. And I went into that place. I stayed seven days through Christmas 1987. I got out. I moved to New York City. All I did was focus on stand-up comedy and recovery. That's all I mm -hmm. did for a year. And things, you know, turned around professionally, personally. A year later to the week, I went on The Tonight Show with Johnny. Uh, the other mm -hmm. guest that night was Bob Hope. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was pretty wild Eighty in December of 88. But anyway, so that was part of, you know, I was running in large measure to hopefully create opportunities for other people who are trying to get sober. That So my idea was, you know, whenever anybody in the state of Massachusetts picks up a phone and reaches out for help, the answer on the other end always should be, you called the right place. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the most profound change or the, my p most profound relationship with government working uh, other than public schools and all public streets and all that, but on a personal level. And so... My, I never really worried about that aspect mm -hmm. of the ding ho or wild parties or things like that. Um, Plus, the bar it, seems to have been set, yeah, pretty low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and there's been so many people, you know, but but so I wasn't that concerned about that because it was part of it was like, well, that was whatever thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a you know new time, and I'm an, a different person, mm -hmm. so I wasn't that concerned about that, but. Um, you know, it it you know the wild the it was pretty wild. It you, but the whole country was on that trajectory in the eighties. Mm. I mean, you saw what happened to Belushi, and you saw what happened to all these people, and a lot of these people just it was those were all wake up calls. But not mm. everybody heard the wake up call, right? Um, but I heard the wake up call not because of Belushi, but when you know people you know are overdosing or. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, dying or going to jail or alcohol and drug related things, then that's that was like to me, oh boy, this is I got to get off this particular path because this mm -hmm. is going nowhere. And mm -hmm. and I met a guy that uh, I met a fellow comic who said, you know, your problem is alcohol. He said, if you ever got off alcohol, you could really do well in comedy, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so I, I paid attention to that, and uh, I I took his advice. And that was a big change after that. It was for a you? huge change. Yeah. What was it yeah. that you found you could do that you couldn't do before? Well, you know, you you're not running with ankle weights on. You mm -hmm. know, you got like you, you're not you're in your way. You're mm -hmm. on stage. You're clear headed. You're on time. You're you're not slurring or, you know, or you're not hung over mm -hmm. or you're just present. Um, the ability to read and just, or the desire to read and to write and to perform and the energy level is different. You're saving money. You know where you were. You know where <laughs> your car is. You know, all these things, all these things that are just, all those, all the, the, just the negative downside of, of too much alcohol is just, uh, it just affects you so much. So anyway, all of those things, you, you just, you just um, yourself and you're, you're firing on all cylinders. Was it tough to stay in comedy and be sober with um, all the other people around you, know, you probably try to? No, it wasn't the other people. It was the scene, you know, being in a bar. Mm -hmm. Being in a bar was really hard. I felt. I felt. And you started out as a bartender. Yeah, in yeah, out. yeah. And you had to work in them, um, and I had to get out of them. As soon as my set was done, I just got out. Mm -hmm. You know, I just left usually, um, and not put trying not to put myself in vulnerable situations where, uh, you know, you might you might be really tempted and just mm -hmm. say screw it. You know. Did you become everybody else's designated driver? Because Bobcat <laughs> Goldthwait told that story on stage. Uh, he yeah. was here with Dana Gould yeah. about hitchhiking with no pants on and yes. winding up in the jail, in jail in Watertown. Yeah. And he he said you were the guy who picked him up. Yeah, he had stayed at my house that night. <laughs> Bobby and I worked. I think we worked at Nick's that night together. 
and we both went out after it and we were hanging out and partying and and uh, he stayed at my house in Watertown um, and I woke up in the morning like 8 o'clock in the morning he was gone so uh-huh. where'd, where'd Bobby go and then he I think the police called about an hour later or two hours later and they said we have your friend Bobcat Goldthwait down here <laughs> <laughs> could you come get him out it was like 10 bucks to bail him out or something <laughs> and uh yeah, and then he went back that night, and you know he quit drinking like in a short period after that. Uh-huh. Within a few weeks or a few months, as I recall, yeah. But yeah, so it's things like that, you know. But did you become that guy that everybody called now because you were the guy who was sober and could um, do it? Probably, <laughs> probably. Uh, but you know, I don't even know if I had a car at that time. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't matter. You were sober. Yeah, right. You could find a car. Exactly. (laughs) But going to New York was dynamite because you're down there. And it was a scene. You know, when I got there in 88, it was it was Colin Quinn and Seinfeld and uh, Mm. Chris Rock and uh, Carolyn Ray and uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, Just a a lot of people. The Brett Butler was down there and people that are, are you know, still very, very formidable. Uh, just a ton of people were there at Catch a Rising Star. And so you get to meet with all, you know, work with all these people. Uh, and Larry David, mm-hmm. you know, Larry David was, he was doing sets and he was a, a great comic. He was a comics comic and he would do sets and not always the people got it, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the audience didn't always get it, but the comedians were cracking up. We were cracking up at him. And, uh, but anyway, he he was there at that time. And I guess he had started earlier than most of us. I think he started in the late 70s. I'm mm-hmm. not positive. But when it was not a real mainstream thing, when it was much more of a boutique uh, kind of uh art form so 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 he would do really well when these like you know from what this is what i've heard i wasn't mm-hmm. there i didn't see it but he had kind of a more esoteric act and um and then as it became more popular and more people came and you know it was harder to have a really smart or kind of offbeat act for a lot of people that were just mainstream mm-hmm. you know so that's when the it was just more high energy performers did well better usually um so but that yeah that was a cool scene well by the time you got to new york what was your act like had you already been working as a a satirist because you didn't necessarily start you know in that no i didn't but you know what was interesting nick is that i didn't even realize i was doing political humor i was just doing what was in the news i was Mm -hmm. just doing what came kind of naturally and in 88 during right around let's see it must have been probably the spring or early summer of 88 as the 1988 presidential campaign heated up and jesse jackson was in the race and dukakis was in the race and bush one was in the race the dad Mm -hmm. um a and m wanted to make a comedy album uh, a political comedy album Mm -hmm. and so they started to audition people in New York to do for this album. And I was just doing what came kind of naturally, what I was interested in. I think most people get into political humor because that's what they like. They like politics or they like talking about it. And and I did as well. And, uh, and that's when the audition came out and they took Barry Cremins, Randy Credico, uh, Will Durst and myself, mm-hmm. and out of all the people in New York that they auditioned, and they probably only auditioned ten people. There weren't a lot of people doing political humor, mm-hmm. maybe ten, and so we got on an album. We got on this album, and so all of a sudden you're kind of a political comic, you know. Uh-huh. But I didn't, I didn't really consider myself a a real political comic at the time. Um, but I did politics, you know. I did things that. I, like I was doing stuff on immigration back then just because it was in the news. Mm-hmm. And so I, in that respect, it was perceived as being um, political. It's also very surreal to hear Randy Credico in the news. Yeah. <laughs> after the, after yes. knowing him as a political comic yeah, and an agitator, hearing him 
involved in in straight news and, and hearing his the the source for our information was randy credico i almost you know i know pulled the you know i almost crashed the car wait yeah. what <laughs> yeah yeah um we had some funny times and so it was me durst kremens and credico on the album strange bedfellows you probably have it someplace yes there. it's it's yeah. within 10 feet of you all right good <laughs> right now good but anyway so and 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 the other thing is that's how i get into the one person shows because mm -hmm. once i once i got started once i got sober reading more paying attention more my act just took a more i want to say serious tact but I, I just did more and more of things that i cared about or that was in the news and um you just evolve that way and one of the ways you could be successful for me was to get out of the clubs mm -hmm. get out of the place where they they you know they the audience is whatever they're there for they're not they're not there for necessary political humor. Right. You, so you did that pretty early getting out i did it out yeah i started to try to work on a one-man show in around 89 mm -hmm. 88 89 90 i saw jackie mason in his one-man show, The World According to Me, in 1989. I saw mm -hmm. it in the theater in New York. It was great. And I walked out of the place high. I walked out of the place just like, I felt like I know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. It was one guy on stage doing exactly what he wanted to do, saying exactly what he wanted to say. It wasn't, it wasn't political, I don't think, mm -hmm. as I recall. I mean, it might have been, you know, on the surface. But it was really about Jews and and uh, Gentiles, and it was just funny, you know, his brand of humor, um, and the audience loved it, and it was, I can remember, I was sitting on the balcony, in the first row of the balcony, and, you know, they have the railing there, and there's 2,500 people in this theater, and when 25 people, 100, 2,500 people laugh, there's a vibration in the audience. Mm -hmm. It's just like you can feel it. And do you, do you know what it's like to be on stage with 2,500 people laugh? Either do no. I. No. So <laughs> no, I but I, I could feel that railing, and the railing's vibrating, and I could feel this this force come into me, and I had this epiphany. I, I know what I want to be, a Jewish comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do know what it's like to be in the audience when that many people are laughing. It's a... It's a, it's a it's kind of a trip the other direction too. It's it's, it's irresistible force. Yeah, I've been in audiences. It's a weird thing with comedy. I've been in audiences where I've laughed at things in the moment that I wouldn't have laughed at watching on TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, there's something about being caught up in that moment in that room yeah. with it's infectious the person. Yeah, the, then when you're watching it on TV or on on your computer. Mm -hmm. You you may even actively dislike it, but there's something about that. Yeah, I agree. It, it well, that's how it was when I saw Jackie Mason, and I said, "That's what I want to do," and I just started just trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And then some other there were some other popular one person shows: Eric Bogosian, mm -hmm. Spalding Gray, and these weren't they they weren't comics, but a woman named Reno down in New York was doing one person shows. She was a she, about me, being she adopted, was a friend. Right? Yeah, and Lily Tomlin. Um, then came John Laguizamo after, mm. and then there was a guy named uh, oh, what was his name? He was from San Francisco. He did uh, only the truth is funny. What was his name? Oh, I don't know that. He yeah, he was one of the first guys, first comic to kind of do something different and to take a more serious approach on. Mm -hmm. uh, on comedy, you know, taking his skills as a comedian and and uh, and d doing a doing a autobiographical mm -hmm. show. I can't remember his name, but nice guy, very nice guy. But anyway, I just kind of went in that direction, a hundred, three hundred and sixty degrees, and mm. and just kept doing it, and uh, and I continued to do it, and that's what I'm back doing today. In your formative years, you weren't necessarily listening to Mort Saul and, and Dick really. Gregory and trying to... Not you know. not really. Not really. I wasn't... I mean, I knew who they were as I evolved as a comic. You know, the names kept coming up, but I wasn't... I didn't have their albums. I wasn't really mm -hmm. listening to them, and I was kind of nervous about listening to them, too, because you know, you know, I don't... This isn't right, but I was just like, oh, I don't want to you know, be influenced by Mozart or be influenced by these people. 
I listened to uh, Lenny Bruce, some of his tapes. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Pryor, I saw his film, you know, uh, Live on the Sunset Strip. That was great. That was when I was in Boston do doing stand-up. That was great. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just... Just in in the the one man shows that I was doing politics was a part of it, but it wasn't the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't the whole thing. It was autobiographical, observational. Yeah. And you wound up having a unique voice as a satirist because you're you're not the fire breather. You're not the 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 Bill Hicks, Vishnu, the destroyer mode of political satirist. Mm -hmm. You're very optimistic. You can see that in in this show. Is it tougher to be optimistic when you're making fun of, of, of politics? I think it's just who I am. It's all about who you are, mm -hmm. you know, I think. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I see the glass basically as half full. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I've, been, I've been very fortunate in my life. That's who, it's just reflected in my shows. Um, and it's also... I think important, even especially now, that I'm trying to grow the pie. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to grow the audience, not only grow them for my benefit, but just in terms of um, bringing people in rather than pushing them out, mm -hmm. psychologically bringing them in, you know, and it's not contrived, but it's just like if you're going to have a conversation with somebody, if you're trying to persuade a family member around a table if you start you know just demonizing what they believe in mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard to uh <laughs> for them to say you know you're right you're right i'm an idiot why haven't i been listening to you all these years oh, somebody said it i think it might have i know lincoln said this but uh, it might not be him originated with him but he said you catch more flies with honey mm -hmm. you catch more flies with honey and so you know, and I'm always aware that there's people in the audience who didn't grow up the way I did or don't see the world the way I see it. And I'm I'm honestly looking to try to, I'm just trying to capture the insightful truth about situations. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do. And, uh, and, and, and if I can make a point and, and be funny with it, great. You know, Woody Allen said, if you if you can make somebody laugh and make them think, that's great. Mm -hmm. No, he said, if you can make them laugh, that's great. He said, if you can make them laugh and think, that's even better. That's mm -hmm. tremendous. He goes, but if you only make them think, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Something, he, that, I'm paraphrasing again. Well, Carlin kind of had that in the later years because he had yeah. a lot of stuff that was philosophical. But if you called him a philosopher, he, I think he... He, I don't think he liked the the term so much. He always yeah. wanted the the funny to be there. It always yeah. had to be funny. Yeah. If he's, he, I think his, cause he came from from when he was, you know, when he was starting out, he he was doing, he was a kind of a gag guy. So yeah. I think he never lost that instinct to what yeah. he was doing. You know, JFK impressions and and yeah, you know. That instinct, I don't think, ever died in him. And he didn't, it, it would be death to just be considered a philosopher and not a comedian to him. Right, right. And that's really important. It really is. The thing about a one-man show that you can do, which I like, is that you can have periods that aren't funny. Mm -hmm. If you're in a comedy club, okay, and you're the headliner, my job is to li deliver laughs mm. in that scenario. But if you're in a theater and you're doing a one-person show, let's just say it's the life of George Collin, for argument's sake. Mm. If George Collin's doing a show about his life or and and he wants to talk about, let's just say, a, a, a divorce or a death in the family or, mm. you know, rebounded from drugs, and there are serious moments in it, it doesn't diminish the show. It adds to the show mm -hmm. if you're in a theater. If you're in a comedy club and you start talking about... <laughs> That your you know your wife died or whatever, and you know you go five minutes on the funeral, that's gonna people are gonna be going what are we you know what are we watching? Uh, this is a comedy show. But if you're in a theater, it's a different. It's you have a blank a blank slate, mm -hmm. and people want to be 
challenged and they they want different moods and they're used to that Mm -hmm. and that's why i gravitated towards theater jackie mason didn't do that Mm -hmm. when i saw him he was doing straight stand-up although at the end he was a cantor also Mm -hmm. and his brothers are rabbis i believe and he came out and um sang at the end uh he came out for an encore and Uh sang of a cappella beautiful i guess uh him or i don't know what the right phrase is in the jewish religion but it was beautiful you Mm -hmm. know and it was uh but anyway that was the most unusual part in in the theatrical sense of his show he was basically doing jokes Mm -hmm. and funny funny original things that he had been doing for 30 years in the catskills Mm -hmm. so um so that's that's the nice thing about doing the theaters that's why when you saw the show the other day at, I'm just working it out there. Right, at that um, comedy studio. Yeah, and I'm working that out, but I'm doing it on uh, June 25th at uh, the ART, the Oberon Room mm-hmm. at, at, at the ART in Cambridge, the American Repertory Theater. Which is a great room. They oh, they, they do a lot room. of burlesque shows, and the oh, donkey show God. is there, and, and I've seen some, some wonderful, some walked, strange and wonderful things in that room. I walked in there, and I said, oh, my God. I got to do a show here. And I was asked <laughs> to do something for a political thing about three or four months ago, six months ago maybe, and I walked in there and go, I got to do a show here. Turns out the head tech person, or one of the head tech was a tech person in my theater, Jimmy uh-huh. Tingles Off Broadway, and they got all the bells and whistles. They have a professional staff. They can do the videos. They can do all this great stuff, and and it's a theater, so you can mm. do you know you can be serious you can talk about you know going to rehab or you can talk about that stuff and they're not going to bum out you can do a serious platform uh you talk about my political platform running for lieutenant governor and they're not going to bum out it's like part of why they're there they they want to hear the serious stuff well it's really good for comedy i think because it's a theater that looks like a club there are there are tables there's a bar in the back and it's this giant sort of open room and there's a a balcony in the back that some shows have have sort of used uh as as a prop so it does feel like you can kind of do anything you want in that space exactly exactly and they do they do dance they like you said they do theater they do burlesque apparently they do the donkey show yeah um and but I I just loved it so I'm I'm excited to be to be there on the 25th of June mm. and you're doing stuff on the Cape too and Wellfleet and yeah I'll be doing Wellfleet on the 21st I'll be doing Wellfleet on July 13th I'll be doing Wellfleet I think it's August 23rd I think it is I'm doing TCAN the Center for the Arts in Natick on the 24th mm. of August I'm doing Katuit, uh Center for the Arts on the 22nd of August. Uh, I'm doing the Chelmsford Center for the Arts June 15th. Um, and and these are just off the top of my head. You're, you're taking the show to New York eventually, right? I hope to. I hope to. Um, you know, it's always tricky when you say you're bringing a show to New York because this is something I've been hoping to do since I was in New York and back in the 90s. Is When I lived in New York, it was much easier to do a show there. When you got to move to New York and and get it off the ground and find a producer and the enormous cost of doing it mm-hmm. you know in in the in the best of the best case scenario yeah i'd like to be doing a show in new york off broadway by the way did you see colin quinn's show i haven't yet but i i do want to Red see State, it i love Blue talking State. to him he's yeah yeah i went to see mm-hmm. him i went to see he's a friend um but i went to see his show uh in in the village and it was great off Broadway, and then it was on CNN a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, about a week ago, and that was great. And we, we're in we're in contact with each other, and uh, congratulated him with it. And he was actually he donated to my campaign. <laughs> him, Dennis Leary, Paula Poundstone. Uh, it was it was nice getting the support. Gary Goldman did an event for me. Mm. Well, yeah. you had Paula Poundstone and Matt Damon doing robocalls for you, yes. which must have been also somewhat surreal. Yeah, that was. Matt was very kind doing a robocall for me. And uh, Paula did a couple of events for me. We did an, an event at Passim's where we raised some money, and she was great. Uh, it was so nice. You know, I in retrospect, one of the things I wish I did with the campaign, and I was, I wanted to do it, 
but the people that you're you're working with on a campaign they're not entertainment people mm -hmm. and so the idea of doing a series of shows around the state is not something that like resonates with them you know uh -huh. <laughs> you know like fundraisers you know it's just a lot of work to do a fundraiser anyway i wanted to do more of that um but it just is it's a it's a heavy lift to get it off the ground well it seems like there was a lot you weren't expecting there's there's a the part in the show where you talk about having filed uh for your intention to run mm -hmm. and then you're at cvs yeah uh, walgreens uh, getting yeah. getting depends for and, my mother right? yeah for your for your mother and, and you start getting press inquiries. Right. My, my, I got a pre The day I filed, I got a call from the Globe. Um, my wife got the call. She was the temporary treasurer mm -hmm. on the campaign. So they call her. I said, honey, I'm going to file this morning. Now, don't tell anybody because we've got to keep this under the hat till, <laughs> right. I get a, till I get everything lined up, you know? Uh -huh. Then we can go public. She gets a call, you know, 15 minutes after I file. Are you... Catherine McDermott Tingle, are you Jimmy Tingle's treasurer for his campaign? For his campaign? <laughs> Is it, did you list her as treasurer? Yeah, the, she was the... a temporary. She goes, well, sort of, kind of. <laughs> what do you mean, sort of, kind of? It says here on the campaign literature that you're the treasurer. Well, I am. I'm the temporary treasurer. Well, I need to talk to Jimmy right away. Well, he's not here. Well, you got to tell Jimmy to call me right away because we're going to press with this. He's running for lieutenant governor. She says, and she, I told her, please don't tell anybody because we have to get our ducks <laughs> right. in a row. Anyway, and then he called me and he says, Jimmy, you're running for lieutenant governor? I said, well, yes, I am. He goes, what are you, nuts? <laughs> well, see, you're used to dealing with, yeah. with me writing for the Globe. As kid, I'm, I'm Kid Gloves. You get to the, the, the political people. Yeah. He goes, what are you, nuts? He says, he says, you have a great life. And my, <laughs> wife, and my wife is next to me going, you do. You really do. And he said, why are you doing this? I said, because I've been talking about social and political humor, social and political issues for many years. And uh, I want to actually try to implement some of the things I've been talking about all this time. Mm -hmm. I want to take it to the next level. He says, can I quote you on that? I said, sure, you can quote me. He goes, all right, we'll be in touch. I said, great. I look forward to it. I don't think much of it. I go, okay, it's an interview. It'll be in the paper in a few days or whatever. Mm -hmm. An hour later, two hours later, I'm in Walgreens. I'm getting depends from my mother. And I get a call from Kathy, my wife. She says, Jimmy, you're not going to believe this. The article came out on Boston.com. It's gone viral. It's uh -huh. in the New York Times. It's in the <laughs> LA Times. Boston comedian Jimmy Tingle declares candidacy for lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. And uh, like I said in the show, I have no campaign manager i have no staff i have no website i have no bank account i have no money <laughs> and mm. all i have is my mother's depends uh -huh. and i'm carrying around walgreens i'm thinking for the first time in my life i might need depends well they, they, <laughs> there is a a certain movement of, of people who haven't been in government yeah finally sort of stepping up and being in government there's a certain uh, well-intentioned naivete that that goes a along with that they, that you hope the the good intentions eventually win out over yeah. the the inexperience is is that something that that uh that you think about when you as a voter or as, as an activist when you're looking at people can they get something done in government uh, i think so mm -hmm. i think so it, it it comes across the passion of people's passion. It usually, it comes across um, if they've been successful in other areas. There's a there's a you know reasonably good chance that they can be successful in in politics. I think a lot of it depends on the personality of the person or you know um, what they did in their previous life. Uh, I mean, my in my case, I never wanted to be governor. I want to help the governor mm -hmm. and I felt on the statewide level I could be a good assistant mm -hmm. I could be a good liaison with the cities and towns I, I like people very much I like you know when I had the theater in Davis Square Somerville one of the best things about it was you're working with all the restaurants you're working with the Chamber of Commerce you're working with the mayor's office you know you're on the same team with the city you're trying to you're kind of a cheerleader for the city mm -hmm. cheerleader for the neighborhood we're doing restaurant deals with all the restaurants. People buy a ticket to the show. They get a 10% discount at Red Bones or the Burren or uh -huh. any of these. So there was a, there's a whole world out there of people with just 
who are working hard, trying to pull in the same direction, trying to improve a neighborhood, trying to improve mm. a city. In my case, trying to make the theater successful, but all inadvertently helping the whole neighborhood. We were bringing, you know, three to four hundred to a thousand people a week into the theater, mm. and you know uh, that all those people would go after the shows. They'd go to Red Bones, or they'd go to the Burren, or they'd go to one of the other restaurants. Johnny Johnny D's at the time, and they would order food, or they would order drinks, or they would buy something in the neighborhood, and it was an economic uh, stimulus to the to the neighborhood. Mm. And I didn't do it for those reasons, you know. I did it. I was trying. I just wanted a place to work. Mm. I was trying to play, get a place where I could do my one man shows on my own terms, and uh, and put other people in there that can do their shows, mm. comedy, theater music, um, all of that. But You've always been a community guy as well. I mean, you spent most of your life in Cambridge, right? You moved yeah, to New York up there, for a while. Yeah. And then and yeah. did you come, was it uh, after you after you moved to New York, did you come back to Cambridge or did you move around a bit? Before? I, um, I lived in New York from uh, 87 to 93. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I moved back. I did a one-man show off-Broadway at the American Place Theater in 93. Mm -hmm. Jack Rollins, we were talking about Woody Allen earlier. Yeah. Jack Rollins came out of retirement to work with me as a manager. That was Uncommon Sense? That was Uncommon Sense, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he was great, he was, what a manager. Um, I mean, he was senior too. He was in his late 70s mm -hmm. when he did it, but he wanted, to, you know, he's, he, he liked what I did. He liked it a lot and, um, you know, he, he came out of retirement and he helped me. He put money into the show to get it up and running. Uh, you know, he was great. And uh, so, but when I did it there, it, you know, we got a nice review in the New York Times, but it didn't sustain itself with ticket sales. So we couldn't really run it indefinitely. It didn't get to Broadway. It mm. didn't get that type of notoriety or, you know, it didn't do that well business-wise. So it closed after maybe two, three months. And I had this nice review in the New York Times and had some nice reviews in the Village Voice and things like this. Mm -hmm. And um, for personal reasons, I said, you know what, I'm, I think I want to move back to Boston mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to do my show. So I just did not want to go back to comedy clubs in New York. I just, mm -hmm. I was so into the, what I was talking about on stage. That's what I was into. You know, and and it allows you to talk about so many different things. I could talk about recovery. I could talk about whatever, whatever was coming down the immigration, homophobia, racism, mm. prejudice, all these other sh topics that really aren't appro always appropriate for the clubs. Anyway, so I was just into that, and um, so I moved back to Boston in '93. My father had passed. My mother was alone. Uh, there was personal reasons that it was helpful for, to me. For me to be back in uh, in Cambridge, and um, and my girlfriend at the time was working here in the South End of Boston, uh, Kathy, and uh, she had her own uh, photography studio, Avante Studio. So mm -hmm. I moved back, and I got the show up at the Hasty Pudding Theater. So I was able to do the show at the Hasty Pudding Theater. They would not produce me there, mm -hmm. and that was the old Hasty Pudding at Harvard. It was Harvard owned, and. Um, but they were empty in the summer. And Jackie Mason had done a show there. Spalding Gray had done a show there. I think, I'm not sure if Lily Tomlin ever did her show there, but Jackie Mason, Spalding Gray, Eric Bogosian did shows. And I said, this is what I want to do. 350 mm -hmm. seats, it's in Cambridge. And they wouldn't produce me there, but they said, you know what we'll do? The theater's dark in the summer. We'll rent you the theater. Mm -hmm. We'll rent it to you. And... And I, it was a big risk. You got to come up with this money, and uh, but that's how I learned how to produce myself. Mm -hmm. It was very liberating. It was very empowering to, all right, I'm going to do six weeks. I'm going to hire a publicist, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, and we're going to do the show. And I know the show works. It worked in New York. It'll work in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and it became the run longest running one person show in Hasty Pudding Theater history. It ran like six, eight months, something like that. And no shows really ran that long. Mm -hmm. But um, it was great. And it brought in a whole different clientele of people. All of a sudden, you're not at the, you know, you're not in the clubs. You're in a 
theater. <laughs> and you had like the Harvard people coming and you had the people who go to the ART coming and you had like people who were just it was a whole different audience and you're, you're part of the fabric here not just in in on the, the comedy scene but but as a, a community community member yeah here and it seems like you've been preparing for uh, a political life outside of of comedy for a long time just at, by being a community member you have humor for humanity you've been uh doing shows to advocate for for particular mm-hmm. causes you uh graduated from the kennedy school what was, as was it 2014 2015 uh 2010 oh 2010 yeah. that yeah. long ago Man, yeah i keep i know it um, seems was, it's flying by nick it's 2019 <laughs> right i, I would check my my yeah the but you're right. Went back to school, and after the theater closed, went back to school. Yeah, I've been involved. So that's what. Was, so when I ran, it in my mind, I wasn't come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like you know, um, Billy Crystal running for you know office. Uh-huh. It was you know, it was like in my. I'm. It made sense to everybody I knew because they know my history. But to the person that didn't know me and know all this, the the, the history, then it was a little. I think in some people's perception was it was a little unusual well, but you also believe in government which is something yeah unusual in in society right. and even more unusual as a comedian mm-hmm. we're going back to the you know the the satirist as the person who tears things down and, yeah. and shakes things up i always felt like i need i feel like i can do more and i wanted to do more mm-hmm. and um and that's really there was just something about uh Try at least trying to get involved that was very appealing and especially after the 2016 election Mm -hmm. because I felt that you know Trump was a big influence on me because I felt if this guy can use his communication skills for that message then I can at least try to use my communication skills for our message for my message and that's what I tried to do Mm mm-hmm an influence as in an entertainer can be can and do this they speak clearly he speaks basically clearly simple i mean the, his whole campaign three words build the wall lock her up drain the swamp make america great it was very simple mm-hmm. and it, it resonated with people and i think messaging is a huge a huge part of uh, what's necessary and in order to lead people you got to explain why you're doing something and f- you know let's let's go in this direction and here mm. are the reasons why not that he was particularly um, articulate around why mm-hmm. but the headlines of what he was trying to do and I felt like for example call the right place Mm-hmm. When someone picks up a phone and reaches out for help in the state of Massachusetts, the answer should be, you call the right place. Mm-hmm. It's very simple. People understand it. It's true. It's authentic. It's my experience. And that's what was you know, driving me. Is that why you believe in government? Is that where that that's sort one. of started? Or was, no. had you always... <laughs> I've always believed in it because I went to public schools. Mm-hmm. I think 90% of the American population are educated in public schools it's hugely important public colleges hugely important public transportation or public infrastructure my father was in the cab business he owned Mm -hmm. cabs we had two cabs when we were growing up they ran a cab company out of the living room now that's private but the streets that he was driving on (laughs) Uh was a public if the streets aren't plowed you can't get a cab from you know central square to harvard square or inman square to Dorchester or anything, you know, you you can't get on the Mass Pike. So it's, the infrastructure of society, whether it's school or hospitals or rehabs or you know transportation, all of it. So yeah, I believe in it. the The whole space race, uh, the mm-hmm. race to the moon, was all government. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, I mean, it wasn't Boeing that was you know motivating it it was it was it was the president kennedy saying we can go to the moon mm-hmm. you know i don't know what private companies they use so maybe boeing was involved but my point is that it was motivated and even you know eisenhower back with the highway system the highway system originally it was it was for national defense after coming out of world war 2 we're going to need roads to connect 
Florida to New York in case we're attacked, or California to, you know, the East Coast, and we got to connect the Midwest through free, a freeway system. And that was all initially national defense uh, motivated, mm -hmm. but obviously it turned into huge transportation, trucking industry, all sorts of industries evolved because you could get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. whether you're bringing oranges from Florida to Massachusetts or you're bringing whatever, wheat or, or you know, goods from the Midwest to the East or West Coast. Well, how would you respond to somebody who doesn't believe in government, who who's very turned off by it, who sees how... how what politics it seems weird to say this what politics has done to government uh in this sense that, that you've got two entrenched parties and and you're a, a faithful democrat uh so what would you say to somebody who sees this institution and, and says it just isn't working for us anymore well the i would say on the front burner if there's gridlock it's not a reflection on the imp the overall importance of government in the society. Mm. Yes, there's gridlock in the society, but still 80% or 90% of the people in the country are going to public schools. So that's all has to work. Mm -hmm. They And we have to obviously improve infrastructure. We all obviously have to improve, you know, a lot of things, healthcare, for example. But I would say that the big, the bigger picture is if government doesn't do it, then who's going to do it? Mm. I mean, who is going to keep the water clean in a reservoir? Or who's going to keep, like, the Charles River? Who? What, what, what was the motivation for cleaning up the Charles River? Mm. It, was a great, it was a great cooperative effort between, and it started back in the 60s and 70s, the Boston Harbor was, there was nothing down at the waterfront on the North End or all those places, Chelsea, Southie, there was nothing mm -hmm. particularly attractive. But business got together with government, government led the way, and it was a win-win-win situation. We're improving the, the, the shore, it's making it more uh, you know attractive for mm -hmm. hotels or restaurants or beaches or cleaner water, uh, the fishing industry, all of this. So... I mean, government's got to lead, you know, uh, they don't always have to implement everything, but it's hugely important. And that's where right now with the green economy, it's going to be alternative energy that's going to get us out of it. And that's going to come out of, you know, innovation and investment in solar and wind and, and all of that. But um, when you have the, the megaphone of a government saying this is important and we have to move in this direction it's going to motivate all these other industries and if you can put some money into it you know and and invest in these companies and invest in the technology the government's been putting money into oil companies for years mm -hmm. they give them oil companies so they can be more effective in exploration so do the same thing for solar and wind and uh and all that mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, it's hugely important. It is working. And sometimes you see people say, well, I don't like government. Well, but they're all in favor of the war. You know? Right. <laughs> you know, well, who who do you think is going to the war? I said, you know, who, who do you think is over there? Well, of course, who's that, paying them? there is some privatization going on in that yeah. as well that doesn't uh, doesn't feel quite right. Right. Uh, right. But I have seen you get angry uh, talking politics exactly once. And I don't know if you'll remember the the instance you were on Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you were talking about uh, government torture. And uh, Nick DiPaolo said something uh, like, you know, we need to get the information. To, uh, I don't care if we have to hook Abdul's nuts up to a car battery. Uh, and... I, I don't think anybody else got a word in until they went to commercial after that. Because it's the it's one time I saw you angry. And I know, so I know you must get angry. Yeah. Uh, uh, about I'm passionate. This, uh, I'm passionate about things. I am. And that, and as I was just talking about government and the importance of it, uh, I do get passionate about things. And I, the point of view comes from a point of view. It mm -hmm. comes from someplace. And so... I can't get passionate about things I don't care about. 
but the things I care about, I, I do get passionate. And you have to be passionate to run for office, mm -hmm. in my experience. It's hard. It was like, you know, 10, 12 hour days uh, every day, seven days a week for a year, mm -hmm. just about. Um, you know, uh, you're raising money, you got to call people and ask them for money. And you got to call you everybody, put, you know, as yeah, you said, and, yeah. ask and I never dollar. got to everybody. I know. I don't think I called you, Nick. I should have <laughs> called you. That would have been mean, the difference. 41.3%. I, yeah. I, I could have at least gotten you another half a percent. <laughs> I, I was initially re, re, resistant to it. I don't want to mm -hmm. call people and ask them for money. I, I'm on the other side of the equation. You know, I've been, you know fairly successful people ask me for favors i don't ask mm. them for favors uh -huh. you know i do fundraisers for other people i don't do fundraisers for myself <laughs> so, and over the years that's how i got into humor for humanity over the years we did you know you just do a lot of things and produced a lot of shows we did a fundraiser for barry back in the day mm. the ding ho reunion and when bob lazarus got sick and um, that Ding Ho reunion, by the way, was my introduction to Boston comedy when I really? moved here. And was it was in ninety eight? It was ninety eight or ninety nine. Yeah, somewhere in that was that was yeah. the one the of the theater. Yeah, that was. I had seen a few shows here before, but I had just moved to Boston. Yep, and that was three hours of Boston comedians, including yep. people I didn't know were Boston comedians that I'd already loved. Right, the Bobcat was one of those. Right, the, right. Yeah, that was great. But I produced that. Mm. And basically, uh, Barry and I, Barry was the co-producer. But I was here and I had just come off. I was on 60 Minutes at the time. Mm. And I had produced myself at the Hasty Pudding Theater. And I had produced myself at the Child's Playhouse. So I knew how to do it. I know mm. how to rent a theater, get the sound people, hire a publicist, get a ticketing service hooked up. You know, I knew how to do it. So I was able to do it. But um, well, the best part of that that show, other than just being introduced to to so much of Boston comedy history in one night, was from my seat. I could see a little bit backstage, and I could see everybody sort of standing and watching other people doing their act and, and yeah. laughing and making fun of them. Maybe yeah. a, maybe a little bit. I don't know if I'm projecting, yeah. but I feel like probably some people were there was some chops busting. Yeah, going on backstage. Sure. So th that show was a was a, a very influential in me in how I looked at this town mm -hmm. oh, uh, good. for for comedy and and it introduced me to so many people I talked to later. Uh, and I don't think, including Barry, who I'm, I don't, I, I don't think I spoke with him until after that show sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a blast and people, it was a fundraiser for Barry. He was sick at the time, but that, that was, um, you know, that was a, that was a great thing, but that's, that's, that's what I mean about getting into politics. It's a form of community involvement, just doing that, mm -hmm. just, so when it came to asking money for myself, it was like a weird thing, uh -huh. you know, to do it. I was much more comfortable and am more comfortable raising it for uh, other people or causes. Uh huh. Uh, I do. I do want to mention just, just briefly uh, that you were on Veep yeah. this this season. Yeah. Uh, playing a a, a, a voter, a yeah. disgruntled voter. Well, you know what I was playing? I was playing a guy that his name was Mr. Spooner. <laughs> And the scene was that, uh, you know, Selena is running for president and they were in, I think they were supposed, they were in Massachusetts and they had, when she was running before, uh, four years earlier or whatever it was, they didn't pay the bill. This guy owned a tent company, a tent uh -huh. rental company, right? And so they didn't, they stiffed them, right? Uh -huh. When they were there before. Now they're back and they want him to put up the tent. And he's like, no way, I'm not putting up uh -huh. the tent. And they say, Mr. Mr. Spooner, Mr. Spooner, could you please put, um, and then you saw the scene, right. you know, uh, madam, I am very, uh, I'm a patriot and I love this country. Yes, she's saying, yes, you do. I said, but I am sick and tired of people like you, these hoity-toity people coming in here with their la da attitude, with total disrespect for the working class people of this country like myself. Uh, and she's saying, good for you. Truth to power. Right, right. <laughs> and then 
at the end of the, they were asking her, why is she running for president? She had to have a good reason. And then mm. she's doing the press conference. She's going, I'm going to tell you why I'm running. I am sick and tired of these hoity-toity people right. with their la da attitudes <laughs> coming in here and just taking advantage of the working class of this country. The funny thing about that, the interesting thing about that, Nick, is that she was about the nicest person I've ever met uh -huh. in the business. Just, I couldn't believe how, how nice she was. We talked about my campaign. We talked about um, that I was running. She asked me if I knew Elizabeth Warren. I said, uh -huh. oh yeah, I've done things with Elizabeth Warren in the past. She really liked Elizabeth. And, um, you know, so it was a, it was a, it was very, very, very nice break from the, from the campaign. Mm -hmm. Because I had been to my mother's funeral that morning the right. day before and I had to fly out the day of the funeral to LA and do this you know this this uh scene with her because they couldn't change the date and my mother passed in between we accepted the gig mm. and that the day of the shooting so we had to do it and so we, I'm so glad we did but uh but she couldn't have been nicer mm. just a super superhero <laughs> So you came close in this election. Yeah. And that that is, uh, I don't think we've addressed this head on mm -hmm. yet. That is what the new show is is mainly about. That's the frame of, of the new yeah, the, show. The, the, the frame of the new show is, um, yeah, 2020 vision. And the kind of the subtitle is, why would a comedian run for office? And I explain why I'm, what, what motivated me to run. Um, and the, some of the process in running some of the stories about running, raising money, and you know, just pulling the whole thing together, and then the, the policy platforms of of uh, you know what what's motivating you, what's behind it, and and also where do we go from here on a national level? Mm -hmm. So we try to allude to some of these things in there, and the immigration reform, and broaden the definition of national defense, and so so there's something to look beyond it's not just looking in the rearview mirror but it's like okay that was part of this but now we're moving forward as a as a society and where are we going and mm. where's the president leading us and what can we do and how can we be involved and what's good what good is coming out of this administration even if it's in the reform of maybe our media or maybe some reform of our society mm. Well, you, you you got forty one point three percent of the vote, yeah. and that that was considering you were running against a guy who was what the great great grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, who was an Obama staffer. <laughs> yeah, he was. He worked for Obama. He yeah. was in the White House. Yeah, yeah. That and considering that, and he the, worked for Elizabeth Warren, and he worked for um, and he's a great guy, and we got along very well. He worked uh -huh. for Mara Healy. Quentin Palfrey is his name. Yes. And we got along really well, and we had a really good relationship as as probably as well as, you know, opponents can have, you know, in a respectful way. Considering you went into this uh, not knowing how to run a campaign, right. would you say that that's true? Am I, am I, yeah, I would but, say, yeah. And I uh, made a lot of mistakes, yeah. What would, what would make you run again? You got close. You got sort of a taste of, of what it's like yeah. to do this. I would... Um, what would make me run again is a a position that I think I could be really effective in, and having people. If I had people around me that wanted to help me, who who believed in what I was trying to do or what we were trying to do, because mm -hmm. it's a team sport, and that were seasoned and knew how to run a field operation, who now know how to get out the vote, who know how to run a fundraising operation mm -hmm. who um, are already you know schooled in creating the website and all the the headquarters and staffing the team and all of the things that that's where all the money goes mm -hmm. it all goes for things like website and campaign manager and deputy campaign manager and field organization and posters and signs and that's where all the money goes that's why you have to raise it mm -hmm. you know but if i was if i were um approached by people who were passionate about me as a candidate and passionate about the issues that we were trying to uh uh you know the issues that were driving us that were motivating us and there was a an attainable goal that you could actually bring something to the table that other people might not bring as well mm -hmm. then then i would be interested mm -hmm. 
what makes you optimistic going forward? What are the things you're optimistic because about? I'm just optimistic about the human spirit, not to be too trite about it, but just the human spirit, people's ability to rebound, people's ability to change their circumstances, people's ability to just roll with the punches and get on with it and, you know, just uh, get through things that seem, you know, really difficult at the time. But, I mean, you just look at the history of the country. Every single generation has challenges. Every generation. Is this more difficult than the 1960s? I don't think so. Are we more divided than we were over Vietnam or or race relations back in the 60s? I don't think so. I mean, the 60s, Martin Luther King assassinated, Kennedy, Kennedy, you know, killed at, uh, while, while serving in office. Um, I don't think this is the worst time. Of, I don't. And I think that we get through things, and I think that... You know, you look at the Civil War where people <laughs> literally killing each other. 600,000 people killed in, in our own country only 150 years ago, whatever it was. You know, so we've been through everybody going through things. You look at the just the perseverance of people who are... Look at the perseverance of just the people coming from Mexico and these people coming from South America and what they're able to endure mm -hmm. for a better life. We can we 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 can we can um, achieve whatever we really try to achieve and put our minds to. We can do in this country, mm -hmm. and so I just think it's about people re removing obstacles to progress. Mm -hmm. And my mo my message to people, they say, "Well, who are you supporting for governor? Who I mean, who are you supporting for president?" My message is, I don't care who it is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work really hard to elect a Democratic president and to... Big D or little get, D. In the yeah, and whoever it is. And I think if people, you know, if you don't like something about this guy, then do something. Don't just sit there and watch television and get angry and point fingers and throw your hands up in the air. Get involved. Help your local town committee. Help Help a candidate. Help the Democratic Party, or if you're Republican, help the Republican Party. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that is great about getting involved is that you meet people and you have positive experiences that you wouldn't have if you weren't involved. And I tell the story about holding the sign for, um, it was uh, actually Martha Coakley was the first one I was holding the sign for in, uh -huh. in, in Central Square, Cambridge. Let's do this. Let's elect the first woman governor of Massachusetts. You know, Jane Swift was governor. She was appointed. But, mm. you know, let's elect the, the first, first woman governor. And, and, and mm. this is so funny because I've updated the story to include Hillary. But I'm out there and I'm making stuff up in Central Square. Let's do this. You know, let's do this. And the kids are, you know, a lot of people not listening to you. They got the headphones on and they're mm. not listening. <laughs> and I start making things up. Listen, you kids, I did not storm the beaches of Normandy <laughs> and take on the Nazis hand to hand so people could not vote on election day. And they're not even paying attention. <laughs> they're not listening. I get even more bizarre. Listen, you kids, I did not take a musket ball to the knee at the Battle of Bunker <laughs> Hill so people could not vote on election day. And this kid comes up to me about 19 years old. This is absolutely true. Dead serious. Looks me in the eye and says, thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're all getting older, but 241. That, uh, yeah, that's a reason to be optimistic and pessimistic I, at the same time. You know, and, <laughs> I think, and I think the current administration may end up ushering in a lot of reforms around the media, around voting. I mean, but we got to rally and we got to get, I, I know I'm sounding like a partisan here and uh -huh. I am, okay? But if you don't like something in the society, then you have to change it or you have to at least try mm -hmm. or live with what, live with the consequences of not trying. Mm -hmm. And so where's the best place for people to find out more about the, the new show and what you're up to? JimmyTingle.com. com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I'll be at the ART on June 25th, and I'll be working all, all over Massachusetts, and I'm up in Jonathan's in Maine and the Gunquick in July, and uh, I'm going to keep plugging, keep writing, keep working, keep moving, hopefully be in New York uh, 
in the fall if that works out but uh hopefully get back on television maybe do another podcast maybe mm. get back on tv get back on radio maybe write a book uh-huh we'll see right that's where we started with all the yeah. books yeah possibly around us now well, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Thanks a million, Nick, for all your help over the years, not only to me, but to all the comics in Boston. You really illuminate the scene. You elevate the scene. You take it seriously, and you, you allow readers to take it seriously. And uh, it's really been you, it's been a great asset having you pulling for us at the Globe. So well, thank much you. appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And good to see you again. Yes. And I'm glad we did the Ding Ho reunion in 99 so you could see what a cool comedy scene we have. And by the <laughs> yes. way, the comedy scene is awesome. All these young comics coming up over at the comedy studio, or wherever you go to see them. I, I encourage people, go out and see these young comics. They're awesome. They're original. They're funny. They're really clever. And uh, that's the next generation. Yeah, no matter where you are, because I, I started covering the scene in Buffalo and there were two clubs and one open mic. And the open mic was a music open mic at the Buffalo airport. And there was only one other guy. There were a bunch of comedians and one guy playing Leonard Skinner covers. And whenever he got up, people would pay attention and cheer. And whenever the comedians got up, they would look back at their drink and stop paying attention. So it's a, you, you, yeah. you as the audience serve an important role yeah. in making sure that, that people... Uh, that that they're they have a livelihood and they want to pursue the arts and they also don't just get depressed and stay in their house all the time <laughs> that's right that's right and boston has such a great reputation for comics you know i was on with dennis miller a few years ago i was on his radio show mm -hmm. and he was just raving about the boston scene back in the day and all the great comics that have come out of here and the and it's just something about this area. You got the influence of the schools. You have the sports influence. You have the history. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Pilgrims, you have all this energy and brains and talent coming together in one place. And the people are funny. You got your regular people yeah. who live here, and uh, they're funny. And we got so we're, we're really fortunate. Well, yeah, every once in a while, I've, I'm influ uh, uh, interviewing somebody. He was somebody that's like a huge name. They'll say, "Hey, do you know Don Gavin? Yeah. Do you know Lenny Clark or, <laughs> yeah. or Steve Sweeney or whatever right. it is? It's 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 just fun to hear those names coming out of John Stewart. Uh, when I, years ago, when I interviewed him, I think when I interviewed him for the Phoenix when I used to work there, yeah. mentioned uh, Gavin and Sweeney. Yeah, John. Um, I, I met John. John opened for me. We did a show together and. Uh, Western Mass back in like, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it was a lot of fun. He was just starting. He started a few years after me. I was probably doing it like three or four years. He was doing it like, I don't know what, one or two or something. Uh -huh. But anyway, yeah. So it's a great scene and we're lucky. We're lucky to have it. And we're lucky to have you advocating for us, Brother Nick. So thank you. Oh, thank you. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Jimmy Tingle for sitting down with me for this conversation. You can find out more about where he's going to be and what he's up to at jimmytingle.com. And if you enjoyed this or any other episode of the Department of Tangents podcast, please consider giving us a positive review or rating or subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Radio Public, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find the Department of Tangents on Spotify and YouTube, and you can also visit the blog at departmentoftangents.com. I am very pleased to present you with this week's featured tracks, excerpts from the audiobook of Nathan Ballingrud's latest collection, Wounds, Six Stories from the Border of Hell. Ballingrud has a remarkable imagination and a delicious vocabulary. Take the subtitle seriously. These are lovingly rendered tales of the horrific. Severed heads with lolling tongues that induce a feeling of violence in anyone around them, angels who tear apart their hosts to be born into this world, and child-eating ghouls. And about that last one, you may have heard rumors about Jonathan Wormcake, about how he and his friends attacked the Coldwater Fair in 1914, what he does up there in that mansion, about how the children are drawn there by ghastly visions. Some of it is true, but Wormcake is dying and he'd like to set the record straight on a few myths about ghouls and how the Skull Pocket Fair came to be before he goes. And that brings us to the beginning of Skull Pocket, one of the six stories in Wounds. Ballingrud will be the guest on next week's episode, and you can find out more about him at nathanballingrud.com or on Twitter under nballingrud. 
Audio excerpts are courtesy of Simon & Schuster Audio from Skull Pocket, read by Danny Campbell, and the compilation Wounds by Nathan Ballingrid. Copyright 2019 by Nathan Ballingrid. Excerpted by permission of Simon & Schuster Incorporated. This first excerpt sets up the story of Skull Pocket. Jonathan Wormkick, the eminent ghoul of Hobbs Landing, greets me at the door himself. Normally, one of his several servants would perform this minor duty, and I can only assume it's my role as a priest in the Church of the Maggot that affords me this special attention. I certainly don't believe it has anything to do with our first encounter, fifty years ago this very day. I'd be surprised if he remembers that at all. He greets me with a cordial nod of the head and leads me down a long hallway to the vast study, lined with thousands of books and boasting broad windows overlooking the Chesapeake Bay, where the waters are painted gold by an autumn sun. I remember this walk and this study with a painful twinge in my heart. I was just a boy when I came here last. Now, like Mr. Wormcake himself, I am a very old man, facing an end to my life. I'm shocked by the toll the years have taken on him. I know I shouldn't be. Mr. Wormcake's presence in this mansion extends back one hundred years, and his history with the town is well documented. But since the death of the orchid girl last year, he has withdrawn from public life, and in that time his aspect has changed considerably. Though his bearing remains regal, and his grooming is as immaculate as ever, age hangs from him like a too large coat. The flesh around his head is entirely gone, and his hair, once his proudest feature, is no more. The bare bones of his skull gleam brightly in the late afternoon sunlight, and the eyes have fallen to dust, leaving dark sockets. He looks frail, and he looks tired. In this second excerpt, we get some grisly detail about Wormcake. While the children are distracted, Mr. Wormcake removes a small wooden box from where it sits discreetly on a bookshelf. He opens it and withdraws the lower fleshy portion of a human face, from below the nose to the first curve of the chin, kept moist in a thin pool of blood. A tongue is suspended from it by a system of leather twine and gears. Mr. Wormcake affixes the half-face to his skull by means of an elastic band and pushes the tongue into his mouth. Blood trickles down the jawline of the skull and dapples the white collar of his starched shirt. The effect is disconcerting, even to me, who has grown up in Hobbs Landing and is accustomed to stranger sights than this. Jonathan Wormcake has not ventured into public view for twenty years since the denuding of his skull, and it occurs to me that I am the first person not a part of this household to witness this procedure. I am here because Mr. Wormcake is dying, and as the resident priest of the Church of the Maggot, it is my duty to preside over his end-of-life ritual. We don't know how a ghoul dies. Not even he is sure. He left the Warrens as a boy and was never indoctrinated into the mysteries. The dreams given to us by the maggot, replete with images of sloughing flesh and great black kites riding silently along the night's air currents, suggest that it's not an ending, but a transformation. But we have no experience to measure these dreams against. What waits for him on the far side of this death remains an open question. In this last excerpt, we get some history about the Skull Pocket Fair. One hundred years ago, says Uncle Digby to the children, three little ghouls came out to play. They were Wormcake, Slipwicket, and Stubblegut, best friends since birth. They were often allowed to play in the cemetery, as long as the sun was down and the gate was closed. There were many more children playing among the gravestones that night, but we're only going to concern ourselves with these three. The others were only regular children, so they are not important. 
Now, there were two things about this night that were already different from other nights they went above ground to play. Does anybody know what they were? No? Well, I'll tell you. One was that they were let out a little bit earlier than normal. It was still twilight, and though sometimes ghouls were known to leave the Warrens during that time, rarely were children permitted to come up so early. That night, however, the maggot had sent word that there was to be a meeting in the charnel house, an emergency meeting, to arrange a ritual called an extinction rite, which the children did not understand, but which seemed to put the adults in a dreadfully dull mood. The children had to be out of the way. There might have been some discussion about the wisdom of this decision, but ghouls are by nature a calm and reclusive folk, so no one worried that anything untoward would happen. The other unusual thing about that night, obviously, was the cold water fair. Dear Young, 